Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending Center for Vein Restoration's National CME Series. We appreciate your attendance of today's webinar. At this time, I would like to introduce our president and CEO, Dr. Sanjeev Lakhanpal, who will provide more information about our National CME Series. Thanks, Jessica, and thank you everybody for tuning in today. Uh, we're really excited about these summer series and CVR as the largest provider of uh, vein care in the country is very, very proud to bring education uh, to a common platform. What we are really trying to do here is bring on one hand, folks in the trenches, our primary care friends, our podiatry friends and other people who are seeing these diseases out in their clinics and on the other hand, bring specialists in venous and lymphatic disorders, whether they be from within CVR or you know, a larger network of people within the United States and anywhere in the world who can tune in and take the time to educate ourselves and share our knowledge with one another. The topic we've chosen for today is venous leg ulcers. Uh, I'm sure most of you know that this is an extremely prevalent disorder. The numbers vary from anything to one to three per 1,000 in the general population. And uh, some studies would say that in people with over 80 years of age, this is as prevalent as one in 50. So for a disorder that is so common, uh, we have our own absolute specialist in that, Dr. Zoe Diol. She is, uh, she's everywhere, right? She's our regional medical director. She's our superstar. She's also our, uh, uh, one of the key associate directors for our own fellowship program. And she is a clinical professor at Michigan State University. So with all those titles and her expertise in venous leg ulcers, she's got a great publication coming on obesity and venous disorders. Uh, Zoe, please uh, take it from there. You are. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Just That's got good. myself unmuted. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to uh, share my screen here for you. But yeah, thank you for that introduction. And. I, um, I didn't know I was everywhere, but thank you for that too. So can you see my screen? Okay, got it, all right. Uh, this is a passion of mine. I have, I, veins in general is a passion of mine, but in the venous world, obesity and vein disease and venous leg ulcers are my two greatest loves. So I was really, really grateful to be able to talk about this and forgive my geek factor, but uh, I get really excited about it. So hopefully you will too. I'm gonna start with a little bit of a dry talk, just a review of anatomy. And that way when people begin to join us, they won't have missed much. But most of the blood in your body is in your venous system, 60 to 70%, and 40% of that is in the legs. The anatomy of a vein, break it down to three parts, the tunica intima, which is the endothelium, uh, uh, I'm sorry, endothelium with basement and elastic, basement mem membrane and elastic lamina. The tunica media is the smooth muscle. That's what maintains the pressure gradient in your vein. And the externa is the collagen or the fibrous tissue for stability. Your deep venous system handles the majority of the blood in your leg. About 90% of the blood in the legs is in the deep venous system. Zoe, I think your screen is static. Your slides are not following. Uh, oh, really? Okay. Saying, yeah. Let me uh, let me try that again. Doctor Deal, if you could also put that in presentation mode, that'd be great. Thank you. Yes, it is in presenter view. I'm going to start again and just speed through those. Uh, yeah, if you go to home and then uh, play yep. from beginning mm -hmm. slide. Yep, there you go. Yep. All right. Can you see them now? Yes. Okay. I'm going to speed through these and hopefully 
we get to deep venous. Okay. So in the superficial system, the 10% of the blood volume is in the superficial system. That includes basically the small saphenous vein, which empties into the popliteal vein in most cases. And then the great saphenous vein, which travels up the medial side of the leg around the medial malleolus and empties into the common femoral vein. A uh, little fun fact for those of you that joined early, do you know you have 16 miles of veins in your body? You can use that at your next Trivial Pursuit game. There are also perforating veins that connect the superficial system to the deep system. Perforators used to be broken down into names like Cockett's, Boyd's, Dodd's, and Hunterian. Now they're uh, level one, two, and three. But to make it simple, you wanna think of this system as a roadmap where your deep system is on the west coast of Italy, your superficial system is on the east coast, and the deep ends up in your heart somewhere around Venice. And your perforators are interchanges between those deep and superficial systems. Now, the valves. The valves are the most interesting part of the venous system. They are one-way bicuspid valves. They're made out of two uh, cytoskeleton uh, structures covered by endothelium, <clears throat> excuse me and they close at a rate of approximately 30 centimeters per second. All veins in your body have these bicuspid valves with the exception of the inferior vena cava, the common iliacs, the portal vein, and the cranial sinus. The venous pump is the calf muscle pump where the large muscle groups in your leg, as those muscles contract, they squeeze the deep vein causing increased pressure in a cephalad direction, causing these valves to open and the valves below to close. And on relaxation, the opposite occurs. The valves in the cephalad direction close, the valves in the caudic direction then open. So looking closely at that, and again, this is a very important concept in order for you to understand why venous ulcers occur. These are the phases of the valve opening and closing. Uh, in the opening stages in one and two, you'll see there's a high uh, velocity of flow from the foot headed towards the head that causes those valves to open and the blood flow is all in the same direction. As you get to phase two of opening, you're gonna start to see what's called vorticeal flow, where the flow now goes in a circular direction on either side of the cusps of the valve. And then at equilibrium, those valve cusps actually vibrate or oscillate. And that's when you have the highest pressure of flow in the cephalad direction in between the valve cusps and complete vorticeal flow behind the valve cusps. And the pressure on the one side is equal to pressure on the other side. As you get to the closing stage, you now have a higher vorticeal pressure on both sides of the valve, valve cusps, causing those valves to come together and the pressure at the feet or the, the ceph or caudad direction is less than the pressure in the cephalad direction. And that's what causes those valves to close. So another little fun fact, oh, oh not yet, but here's a great video. This is an ultrasound showing these valves opening and closing. This is venography. So you can actually see the oscillation of the valves at equilibrium, opening, closing, and oscillation. And then this is another fun fact, which I like to throw in there. Who first described similar flow dynamics in the sinuses of Valsalva in the aorta? Leonardo da Vinci. So he knew all about blood flow and valves way back then, and we're still fascinated by it today. Perforator flow dynamics are even more important to understand when it comes to understanding ulcer disease. So hopefully I can go slowly through this, and then we're going to come back to this later. In this little diagram, if you can see my pointer, this is the superficial system. This is the deep system, and this circle represents your calf muscle or any muscle in the leg. This is the perforator. When the calf muscle contracts, 
it squeezes the deep system, the blood will then be pushed up the deep system and the perforator is squeezed closed. So the superficial system and the deep system are running cephalad side by side. On relaxation, when that calf muscle relaxes, all of a sudden the blood is sucked out of the superficial system into the deep system and that adds more blood flow into the deep system heading towards the heart. This is normal perforator flow dynamics. Now, why do you have those perforators? If you didn't have the perforators, your superficial system would not empty into the deep system all the way until you get to the top of the leg in the common femoral vein. So the perforators provide additional access from the superficial to the deep all the way up the leg, which is great when you end up having a thrombus or a clot, you have bypasses. And here again is a little animation showing the deep system in the muscle, the superficial system in the fat, and the normal perforator dynamics. Blood flow is able to go up through the superficial system and from superficial to deep, anywhere along the leg. Now, bidirectional flow in a perforator is normal because when the valves are being closed by the deep system, there is a temporary backflow of pressure from the deep system into the superficial. So you can see retrograde flow in a perforator and that can be normal. So how do you know when it's pathologic? According to the Vascular, uh, Society of Vascular Surgery and American Venus Forum, these are the criteria for when it's pathologic. If your perforator is 3.5 millimeters or larger, or the retrograde flow is more than 500 milliseconds or half a second, that's considered pathologic. Those are the guidelines under when you can consider a perforator being a pathologic versus normal retrograde flow. Now there are two main types of pathologic perforator flow overload and blowout. And this is critical in understanding how and when to treat a patho pathologic perforator. Again, I'll go through this relatively slowly, hoping that you can understand this and see this later. Again, this is the deep system. This is the superficial system. Your superficial system, if it is the primary offender, this is the problem you're gonna have an overloaded superficial system causing pressure now on your perforator. That pressure eventually will dilate or stretch out this perforator, causing the valves in the perforator to become incompetent. And in that case, you now can have retrograde flow from the deep system into the superficial system, and you have an incompetent perforator because of an anti-grade flow problem. A blowout incompetence or retrograde perforator uh, abnormality is when your deep system is the primary problem. In that case, you've got an obstruction somewhere in your deep system. So the pressure as the blood is trying to get up your deep system is high and it, there's a resistance here. Now, because of that, there is backflow causing pressure on your perforator, causing the perforator to dilate, and then causing retrograde flow from the deep into the superficial, secondarily dilating your superficial system, making it now incompetent. So in the retrograde type, the deep system is the problem, and it secondarily dilates your superficial system, whereas in the anti-grade type, your superficial system is the problem, dilating your perforator and secondarily making the perforator the problem. I hope I made that clear because here's your little spoiler alert. If you stick around to the very end, I'm gonna show you a patient. I'll show you the leg, I'll show you the ultrasound, and I'll show you the before and after treatment so you can see exactly the difference between these two types of incompetence. All right, so back to venous insufficiency, the pathophysiology of it. The physical, the valve is the problem in venous insufficiency. Now, what causes that problem? There are many different things. This can be a hereditary problem. 
where you get aging or premature aging of the valves, fibrosis, decreased valve incompetence. It can be secondary where you get thrombosis from a DVT or an SVT causing splitting or tearing or thinning of the valve walls where you get inflammation and hypertrophy. So I'm gonna show you this picture again because this is a normal valve and I'm gonna show you next venography of uh, a post thrombotic valve. So see how beautiful that is. You can see everything perfectly. Here is venography of a post thrombotic damaged valve. It looks like hamburger meat. Basically it's shredded. So you can see how this is completely incompetent. Blood can go either direction. There is no closure of this valve. And this one is, like I said, this is a post thrombotic, a previous blood clot. So how do you explain this to your patient? I think part of being a good doctor is being a good communicator. So I like to share when I do my talks, I like to share with you how I explain it to my patient. I know I've got a variety of different doctors and people watching this presentation. Some of you are primary care, some of you are vein experts. Um, either of you, when you're trying to explain to your patient what's going on with their legs and why they see what they see and why they have an ulcer, uh, here's what I tell them. Your circulation is like the pipes in your house. You've got two sides, the sides of your circulation. You've got the incoming water. Those are your arteries. Those are high pressure. And then you have the outgoing sewer lines. Those are your veins and those are low pressure. So the arteries bring the fresh blood in, the veins take the old blood out. Then I compare their calf muscle to a sump pump in a house and they can visualize this. And I explain to them that when their calf muscle squeezes, it's just as when their sump pump squeezes. And there is a pipe that goes up and pushes the water from the basement all the way up to the main level, to their water filtration. There are check valves in their sump pump pipe, and they all know what that is, and those check valves are what keep the blood or the water going in the correct direction. And you can even see in this demonstration here, there is a little word here saying perforators. There are perforators that allow the water in your basement to go through the gravel to get into the sump pump. And then uh, this again is just a little video animation of reflux where the blood is going up and then circulating back down. So when you have incompetence, it's like your sump pump fails. Your basement floods, meaning your legs start to swell, they fill with water. That water is dirty and used, so you start to see discoloration in the legs. And then eventually, you're going to get a blowout somewhere, a pipe that bursts, and that is your ulcer. So this is my little talk to my patients. Hopefully that helps you if you want to explain this to your patients. Now, how do we qualify vein disease and how does it lead to an ulcer? We qualify it based on SEEP score. SEEP is C-E-A-P, C stands for clinical, E is etiologic, A is anatomy, and P is pathophysiologic. We basically just use the clinical, the C score. So C1, this is spider veins. These will not lead you down the road to ulceration. C2, varicose veins, these may or may not lead you down the road to ulceration. C3 is when you start to really worry. That's where you have leg swelling. So you know you've got some significant problem in the leg at this point. C4 is where you have the hyperpigmentation. Now the pressure on your skin, you can tell has had some damage there. And uh, this is called hemosiderin staining. I'll jump to C6. C6 is when you have an active ulcer. And then C5 is where you've got a healed ulcer. So as a primary care physician, if you're watching, try to stop it, nip it in the bud when it's at this stage or this stage. Once you get to this stage, a lot of this damage is irreversible. So you don't wanna to get to this stage. It can lead to further problems such as lymphedema, which you'll hear about in our next talk. Uh, but uh, yeah, nipping it in the bud is what you wanna do. Now, how did you get that ulcer? What's the pressure in your legs? Let's look at it. So what is the pressure in your ankle bone? 
at uh, you're laying down, your pressure here in your ankle bone is 10 millimeters of mercury. When you stand up, the pressure down at your ankle jumps to 90 millimeters of mercury. So this is what it's like when you're standing still. Walking, basically, seven steps will drop the pressure at your ankle down to 25 to 35 millimeters of pressure. So this is why walking is really important. And when you look at your patients and what they do for a living, if they're sitting at a desk for a living or standing at a production line in a factory and not moving, this is the pressure at their ankle for however many hours a day they're working and not walking or not moving. Now that's in a normal patient. Let's look at somebody who's got venous insufficiency or incompetent valves. In a normal patient, I just told you, the pressure goes from zero lying down, creases all the way up to about 85 standing up. In an insufficient patient, it jumps all the way up to 100. Taking seven steps down at the ankle in a normal patient, it drops down to about 25 to 35. If you have valvular incompetence, even when you take seven steps, when you walk, that pressure will not get much lower than about 85. So in that patient, you've got a person in a standing job with venous insufficiency, that C2, C3 patient, the pressure at their ankle is not going to get much lower than 80. So you're asking for a problem quickly. Why else should you care about it? Here are the facts with venous ulcer patients. Dr. Paul mentioned this at the beginning, but approximately 1 million people in, just in the United States are affected by venous leg ulcers. 21% of all wounds in wound care clinics are venous ulcers and 50 to 70% of leg ulcers are venous. Here's the big one, 15 billion dollars is spent annually treating venous ulcers. So this is before you, this is not including the treatments that we use in vein centers to actually cure the ulcer. So you want to get to these before they get to that. And this is why you'll see a lot of big companies now uh, that we work with really looking at protecting their cut, their, their, I'm sorry, their employees' legs. Uh, we do health fairs at BP, G Chrysler, GM, and we are training these guys to now wear compression stockings at work. Just like you would see a construction worker wearing a hard hat to protect his legs, jobs where you're on your feet all day, you should have compression stockings on. If you have venous insufficiency, it should be mandatory. Now let's go to diagnosis of leg ulcers. So how do you know when you look at a patient, they've got a sore on their leg, is it venous, is it arterial, is it diabetic, is it a pressure sore? I'm gonna give you some basics on how to know if it's venous, and this isn't always true. This is just, you know, as if everything in medicine, it's not textbook, but these are some general guidelines. They are often located at the medial lower aspect of the lower leg, that is right around the medial malleolus. If you remember that first picture that I showed you with the pressure down at the ankle being 90 millimeters, this is the origin of the great saphenous vein. And that is where the pressure is going to be the highest. So this is the most likely area for you to get an ulcer. Also, the entire path of the great saphenous vein going all the way up the medial leg where the perforators are, those three cockets perforators that I told you about, level one, level two, level three, great place to get an ulcer. Now you can get them higher up, you can get them on the lateral side, but as a general rule, if you see one here, think venous. Another geek question, why do they call the medial lower one third of the leg the gator region? I love to throw that out. Uh, back in the day, people used to wear these garments called gaiters because on their spinning wheels, they were trying to protect the medial lower aspect of their leg from getting trapped in this machine. And we still have something similar. If any of you out there are equestrians like I am, half chaps are for the exact same reason. They're padded on the medial lower aspect to protect the friction against the horse's belly. So that, if you wanna think about it, is where you're gonna see a venous ulcer. Now, progressive stages of venous ulceration. In the acute stage, the ulcer resembles a severe paronychia. It is boggy 
congested. It usually has a base of white fibrinous, fibrinous material and exudate. It has irregular borders as opposed to an arterial ulcer, which looks like somebody took a hole punch and has a nice punched out ulcer. The venous ulcer is almost as if the skin was torn from the pressure. Now a healing ulcer, it has a shallow base. It's all uh, granulomatous tissue. And again, irregular borders. So this is a typical venous ulcer, but this one is on the stages of healing and it's got a nice lip of endothelium here. You'll often also see the hyperpigmentation of the leg around the ulcer. And this is a common question that I get. Uh, usually before a patient ends up to, to see me in my office, a uh, doctor has sent them to a dermatologist or they've asked, do I need to biopsy this? When to biopsy, when not to biopsy. So in uncomplicated venous ulcers, number one, it doesn't help very much to do uh, biopsies or cultures to see if it's infected in non-complicated ulcers. You only do biopsies when you suspect a malignancy or if you're, not, uh, if you're suspecting a vasculitis or something such as pyoderma gangrenosum. Uh, now malignant transformation, another famous question of mine, what is the name of a chronic ulcer that has undergone malignant transformation? Marjolin's ulcer. So those can occur not only in chronic venous wounds, but in burns and uh, chronic scars. Malignant transformation happens from chronic irritation. So I'm bringing this up because venous ulcers, if you treat them externally without treating the underlying problem, they recur. It is the recurrence and the, the chronic constant closing and opening, closing and opening, stretching and, and scarring that causes malignant changes. Another reason to treat the source of the ulcers. So a Marjolin's ulcer can look something like this. There are two types. There's the um, flat indurated type, which has the worst, oops, worst prognosis. And then it, there's the warty exophytic type that has a better prognosis. So if you see some, an ulcer that looks like this, that is an ulcer that does have an indication to biopsy and you wanna biopsy the edge of those ulcers. Uh, this is just for uh, the sake of drama, but this is a Marjolin's ulcer from a large chronic burn on the, on the back of a child in India. And you can also get them in other locations, but this is a severe Marjolin's ulcer from untreated chronic venous disease right at the medial malleolus. So this is your absolute ultimate worst case scenario. All right, so as promised, I'll tell you when it's exciting and I'll tell you when it's not exciting. Coffee time. This is where if you wanna go heat your coffee, you can, I apologize, but this is down to the pathophysiology. And anybody that sticks around for this part please call me, I'm, I'm looking for partners in my region and if you're a geek like me, I would love you on my team. So the pathophysiology, here is the skin. This is the subcutaneous tissue. These are fibroblasts, these red things. This is a venule. These little guys in here are macrophages, macrophages, and these little dots are uh, transforming growth factor beta one. So this is your normal scenario I'm gonna show you. You have a wound or an injury. That's what this little line is represented by here. And here's what happens. Transform, oh, first before I tell you, the transforming growth factor beta is a cytokine and that controls cell growth, proliferation, and apoptosis or death. So here's what happens with a normal injury. These leukocytes by diapedesis, they start to walk out of that little venule. They head over to these fibroblasts and transforming growth factor beta one is now released. That transforming growth factor beta one will then hit those my, uh, fibroblasts, transforming them into myofibroblasts. Those are contractile. And also, it will stimulate the RAS system. So RAS is a small GTP binding protein. It's important in signal transduction pathways. 
used by growth factors, such as epidermal growth factor, it differentiates or initiates cell growth and differentiation. So you wanna think of the RAS system as like your cell phone signal, okay? So that signal has to get all the way up to the skin through the subcutaneous tissue to indicate what to do now here at this injury and what to do with these fibroblasts, turning them into myofibroblasts. It also uh, induces MMP synthesis, which is matrix metalloproteinase, and it releases cytokines such as IL-1, IL-6, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. That upregulates the uh, inflammatory process. So to break this down, so MMP1 and MMP2 matrix metalloproteinase, they degrade collagen and uh, decrease fibrinolytic activity MMP1 degrades collagen type 1 through 3, and MMP2 degrades collagen type 4. So to translate this in English, all of this that happens here will now eat away or digest all the dead tissue, and then these myofibroblasts uh, contract and cause contraction of the wound edges, bringing that wound closer and closer together, allowing it to heal. That's in the normal process. So now, I don't know why I had that sound effect. Here you have uh, venous insufficiency. So if you want to remember back to that picture with the swollen edematous leg, it totally interrupts the signal. So you want to imagine your cell phone signal in a storm. That signal goes down. It cannot get to where it needs to go. These myofibroblasts, some of them are, are contractile, some of them remain as fibroblasts. Some of those RAS, the, the RAS activation cannot get some of those cytokines to the wound edge in order to degrade all that tissue. And the end result is you have a non-healing ulcer. So hopefully that made sense. So management of venous ulcer. Any of you on a coffee break, if you can hear me, now's the time to come back because we're getting back to the interesting stuff. All right, management. What are the correct steps in managing a venous ulcer? Now that you know what it is, now that you know why it happened, now here's what to do. Number one, you've got to exclude arterial disease. Just because you have venous insufficiency and a venous ulcer, it doesn't mean you can't also have arterial disease. So you've got to exclude that because the step two of this system is compression stockings. So how do you exclude arterial disease? You know, first you question your patient, any signs of claudication or uh, decreased uh, pal pedal pulses. You want to check ankle brachial indexes. As a brief review for some of you, ankle brachial index, you want to take the blood pressure in the arm, the brachial blood pressure on both sides. You take the highest systolic pressure and you use that as your denominator. Then you go to one leg, you take the pressure, the systolic pressure in the dorsalis pedis and then the posterior tibial, whichever is the highest, you put that in the numerator. And, and you look at this chart. If it is 1 to 1.4, that's normal. 0.9 to 1 is acceptable. Uh, 0.8 to 0.9, you start thinking about arterial disease. Anything between 0.5 and 0.8, you've got moderate arterial disease at this point. You really want to think about doing further studies other than an ABI. Um, arterial uh, Doppler and um, possibly an arteriogram. Anything less than 0.5, absolutely, you need to do the entire arterial workup and absolutely do not use compression stockings. So you can't go to stage two of venous ulcer treatment if you've got less than 0.5 ABI. Step two is compression therapy. We need to talk about that so you understand the right types of therapy. So there are two basic types of compression therapy. You have uh, compression stockings and you have uh, short stretch wraps. So wraps, when you have a venous leg ulcer, are, in my opinion, the way to go. 
and you have short stretch wraps, compression stockings versus compression wraps. I'll try to explain this. Compression stockings expand and contract as your muscle expands and contracts. Short stretch is exactly that. They stretch just a short amount and then they come back. So as your muscles contract and press outwards against those wraps, when the wraps don't stretch, it turns your leg into a water and blood pumping machine by pushing all that blood and excess fluid up. So you are turning your leg into a, a, a pumping device by using a short stretch wrap. And that is truly the best type of compression for a venous leg ulcer. And what are short stretch wraps? You've got the old fashioned or the tried and true Una boot. Most people on this call, I'm sure, have heard of Una boots. Uh, Una boots have usually an inner layer which is medicated to help heal the ulcer. And then an outer layer, it's multi-layered, but the outer layer is your, your non-stretch uh, inelastic wrap. You also have self-applicable short stretch wraps, such as uh, circades, the juxtalite, uh, ferro wraps. These are Velcro, so the patient can apply these at home and change them daily. Una boots you need to leave on usually for a week and then they have to come back to the wound care center or to you to have them removed, uh, have the wound cleaned and then reapplied. So there is an advantage to being able to do this at home. And the other advantage is these are Velcro. So they're easy for the patient to take on and off. Uh, I already explained this slide as far as the compression stocking versus the wrap. But let's go to the compression stocking. The goal of a compression stocking is basically just to restore blood flow and reduce edema and prevent lymphatic disease. You're protecting your skin here. So please, again, another plug for our next talk by uh, Dr. Satwa is lymphatic disease. You eventually want to avoid that by treating venous disease early. So a true compression stocking is a gradient pressure. It is highest at the foot and ankle, the pressure, and it gets looser as it goes up your leg. A big question I get, um, what compression, what strength should I prescribe? And the answer is, it depends on what you're treating. A good tried and true number is the 20 to 30 millimeters of pressure. Uh, this is a good use all around. You don't need a prescription for this, and it's very rarely covered by insurance but it's for um, aching, pain, swelling, and varicose veins. If you have venous ulcers, you really wanna be in the vicinity of the 30 to 40 millimeters of pressure. That's what you're gonna see in the compression wraps. Uh, in a stocking, you're gonna have a hard time getting a patient to actually put that on. They're gonna complain that it's very, very hard to get on. And patients with, or people without any kind of vein disease, uh, like myself or, or workers that are on their feet all day and just wanna avoid the swelling, you can go with the lower pressure. Another question, aren't TED hoes the same as compression stockings? And these patients will tell you, oh yeah, I got those at the hospital, I wear them, I don't need any compression stockings. Absolutely not, they are not the same. TED hoes are anti-embolism stockings. They are made for when you're lying down. There's a high pressure at the ankle, true, but then it gets uh, lower, then higher, then lower. Th these are designed, again, to prevent blood clots during surgery while you're lying in bed. And the compression stockings, tighter at the foot and ankle, get looser as you go up. They're made for you being in the upright position. And another good compression for lymphedema, they even have higher grade compressions in the 60, 50 to 60 range wraps. And the ultimate would be a home compression pump, uh, which we can explain or Dr. Sat will, will explain in his later uh, talk. So now on to the really the best part of this talk is the management of venous ulcers as far as surgical intervention. So that's step three of your intervention. Now, how do you know when to manage or treat a perforator that has caused a venous ulcer? I'm gonna go back to that very beginning part of the talk where I talked about the antegrade or overload perforator versus the retrograde or blowout perforator. So this is the spoiler alert, super cool. Um, antigrade, the correction of the superficial venous reflux alone, that will usually 
make the perforator revert back to its normal function. Whereas if it's a retrograde or blowout perforator causing your ulcer, if you correct the superficial system, you will still see uh, the perforator problem because your, your primary problem isn't superficial, it's deep. And of course, the obvious question is, well, how do you know that before you start thinking about treating? Well, you don't for, for the most part. You can get an idea by looking at the patient. As a general rule, incompetent perforators in seat classes two and three are more likely to be as a, a result of the anti-grade overload pattern. So they're more likely to be a primary superficial system problem. Whereas incompetent perforators in seat classes four and six, which as a reminder, those are the hyperpigmentation, ulcers, healed ulcers. Those are more likely to be associated with the retrograde blowout pattern with the primary problem being in the deep system. Now again, you're not gonna know this when you first see your patient. You can get an idea and this doesn't always hold true. So the correct way to treat it, oops, that's my great picture. The, the correct way to treat this is treat the superficial system first, leave the perforator alone. On your follow-up exams, maybe a month, three months or six months out, you wanna reassess the patient, reassess their leg, and reassess that perforator. You might see if, if it is uh, uh, an incompetent perforator with the anti-grade flow in a, in a class two to three patient, you might have seen deep system reflux even, which corrects itself after you correct the superficial reflux. And that perforator will go back to normal and the patient's gonna tell you their leg feels great. Uh, in this one, you're gonna treat the superficial system. You're gonna look at them one, three or six months later you're gonna see a slight improvement maybe early. And in one of your follow-ups at three months or six months, you're gonna see that perforator is still there. You might see a, a recurrence of the superficial system reflux and you're still gonna have the pain and the ulcer. So here is one of my patients and this patient came in and you can see he's got seat class three. So as a review, he's got a swollen leg, so he's got edema. If you look right here, you'll see this giant lump. This is a perforator, Un unbelievably. You rarely see this uh, from the outside, but this guy had this huge lump. Here is his ultrasound. The size of that perforator was massive. And if you look at his subcutaneous tissue up here, so here's superficial, Here's deep, and here's this big superficial or perforator pushing out against his skin. But what you don't see is varicose veins. So you notice you don't see a whole lot of varicose veins. You don't see uh, skin changes. You see a, a few here. So I did what I just told you. I, he had superficial system uh, reflux. His greater saphenous vein was refluxing top to bottom in this leg. This leg was completely normal. So I did a blade of uh, his GSV. Uh, I, I left his perforator alone. And here he is just one month later. Look at the leg. I, I was pretty amazed. Uh, that lump is almost all gone. That perforator on his follow-up scan, I, I, it was barely visible. It was down to normal. Good flow, one, di one direction into the deep system from superficial. And he felt great. So... That's your anti-grade and seat class three overload incompetence. And here we go to a retrograde or blowout incompetence. This guy came into me and yes, he's got edema. This is his left leg. He's also got a massive amount of varicose veins. This isn't the best picture, I apologize for that. A lot of his veins went all the way up the side of his leg. But you can also see here, he's a seep class four since he's got hyperpigmentation and this is pre-ulcerative change here. Here was his scan. This perforator was a giant massive, this is one. This is his thigh perforator, lateral thigh. This is his calf perforator and you see these massive varicose veins up here. So again, great lines of his muscle. So this is the fascia on his muscle, uh, a big squirrely perforator his skin up here, and all of these varicose veins. 
But again, I wasn't sure, you know, I didn't, you don't go looking at the deep system higher up until you do the right thing. He had also refluxing greater saphenous vein, top to bottom. So I treated that and here he is post procedure, three months out, a little bit better. Still, he's got these blowout varicose veins again, hyperpigmentation and pain and swelling. He got a little bit better at one month and back to almost where he started at three months. So I uh, knew then he's got something higher up. And what you look for then is what's going on in his iliac system up here. And another little thing, this is his left leg. So it's not uncommon to see this in something called May Thurner's where you have compression of the left common iliac from the right uh, iliac vein going over, or from the right common iliac artery. You have compression of the left common iliac vein from the right iliac artery as they pass over, as the vein passes over to go into the IVC. And he might've had a, a clot at some point, he doesn't remember. So post-thrombotic, left leg, all these signs and symptoms, good chance it's a blowout retrograde and you've got a deep problem. Hope I made that point really clear. Now, again, this is just to show you, this is an atypical pattern, but this was also a venous ulcer. It's on the lateral malleolus. So not all venous ulcers are medial malleolus, lower leg. But you can see that this is torn edges here. This poor guy had been dealing with this ulcer for years. He would go to the wound care center, he would get an uniboot, he would get debrided, the ulcer would heal, it would reopen months after, and he's been dealing with it, like I said, for, for years and years. He came in, we treated that perforator, that incompetent perforator that he had, and it healed within four weeks, and at one year has not recurred. And here's, again, another photo of a pa patient, medial malleolus, about 17 years, this patient, 70 years old. You're never too old to have an ulcer treated. And uh, this is post-ablation. Uh, radiofrequency ablation. So this is a question I get a lot from referring providers. Uh, they read, uh, obviously, the good medical magazines, British Journal of Medicine, the New England Journal of Medicine, and they'll tell me, well, I read an article saying that compression is more effective in healing the ulcer uh, than surgery, at least in the short term. And I'll tell them, you're absolutely right. That was a good study that came out. It was called the Eshgar trial. It came out in the 2007 British Medical Journal. However, later, that same group that did that study did an extended trial called the EFRA trial, which came out in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2018. And I'll tell you about those two, and you can look them up or we're happy to show, uh, share those references with you. In the 2007 study, it was designed to uh, compare the effect of compression with surgery on healing an ulcer. They started the study in England in 1999 and ended it in 2002. And what they found was the surgical correction patients versus the compression did not improve ulcer healing rates, but it did improve ulcer recurrence. However, the EVRA trial in 2018, it was a three-year trial from 2013 to 16 with 20 centers across the UK. They were randomized to early uh, endovenous ablation with compression, so early meaning within two weeks of diagnosis of the venous ulcer, or compression first with deferred healing about six months after the ulcer healed or earlier if the ulcer did not heal. And for compression, they used the short stretch multi-layer bandages, not compression stockings. The conclusion, they had faster ulcer healing when they had early endovenous intervention and compression. And the faster healing was, yes, part because of the compression, but part because of uh, the ablation of the underlying problem. So you're reducing that pressure on the problem. The problem is going to heal quicker. Now, the treatments, the, the treatments were, methods were variable. The most common treatment they used was ultrasound-guided foam. We have so many tools in our toolbox, and one of our future talks is going to talk about all those different tools. So I'm not going to get that detailed here since I kind of went into so much of the pathophysiology of venous ulcer disease. 
but uh, one of our other speakers will talk about that. So wrapping up to the end of my talk, here's my commercial talk. Uh, I'm expanding, so if any of those really, really detailed uh, slides appeal to you, please give me a call. I'm looking for new doctors in my region. Also, I would love to see you in person. I'm giving a much more detailed talk on venous ulcer disease at the AVLS conference. That conference is going to be at the CVR home base there in Washington, D.C. It's October 15th through the 18th. Uh, my two talks will be on the 15th, so get there early. One will be on emerging technologies in vein treatment. So that is a, a super cool high-tech talk. And then again, on a more in-depth talk on venous ulcer disease. And you can register for that talk at uh, this little link here. And again, another pitch for my, my buddy, uh, Vinay Satwa. He's going to be talking on June 26, which is another Friday at noon, on lymphedema. And this is something, again, that you've got to treat vein disease early, not just to avoid the venous ulcer complications, but once you get to that lymphedema stage, some of that is irreversible. So please get there before the irreversible damage has been done. Hopefully I taught you something. And like I said, I hope to meet you all in person. And I think we're gonna be taking some questions now. Well, Zoe, thank you very much. I mean, this is probably one of the best spent hours I've had in education. <laughs> so really this was so, you know, uh, the span was amazing. You've touched on everything. Uh, awesome. Let me ask you one key question. If you sure. are the doctor in in place of your primary care doctor, if you are the person who first sees a patient with, uh, say, half a centimeter ulcer in their gator areas, yes, how do you want the PCP to proceed? Do they first send the patient to a vein center? Do they first do an arterial study? Do they first get an ultrasound evaluation? Do they send the patient to the wound center? Mm -hmm. Imagine uh, yourself in their shoes. How would oh, you yeah. like them to triage well, that patient? 100% send them first to a vein center, and here's my rationale. The patient is frustrated. Number one, they've usually been through so many different places that they've almost given up uh, on having this ulcer heal. So when they get uh, shipped to multiple different locations, they end up getting multiple different versions of the same test. Uh, they'll go to a hospital, they get an ultrasound done, the ultrasound done at a hospital uh, radiology usually checks the deep system with the patient lying down, does a couple of squeezes and says, yeah, they've got some insufficiency, that may be the problem. Uh, that tells us nothing as far as how we're able to treat the patient. Doing the ultrasound in the proper way, in the upright position, vigorously mapping out every perforator and every area of reflux in order to map out the correct treatment is critical. So then we're gonna end up repeating that whole thing and you can avoid all of that frustration by getting them here first. Number two, knowing when to, what type of compression and when to put it on is somewhat confusing. I, I touched on it here, but I think a lot of my uh, primary care physicians say, oh my goodness, I, I just am not sure about that. I worry, what if I do put a, a stocking on somebody that does have arterial disease? When you have that uh, set, that toolbox, in your, in your practice, you can piece that apart and know exactly what to do. For example, I mentioned when you get to an ABI of 0.8 or 0.9, I might still prescribe compression, but I'll do a diabetic sock, you know, and I will reduce the compression at the ankle. I'm still getting some treatment. And then I'm looking at the arterial studies. But you, rather than sending a patient out in multiple different directions, and again, they, they can sometimes end up at a dermatology office with biopsies. That's why I went through this whole biopsy thing. Avoid all of that. Get them into one place. Figure out exactly what this is, the exact right way to treat them, and then you can reduce that $15 billion that is spent annually with all those different other directions that, that the patient ends up going in. Now, you know, I've got some doctors that are primary carers that are, are, have been working with me for a very long time, and they have gotten used to knowing exactly what to look for. 
and they will prescribe stockings. That's great. It, it saves me that step. They know exactly what to prescribe. So I'm never going to say don't do any of that. But if you're not exactly sure, the best way is to get them to a vein center first. Then we can handle all those steps appropriately and save them from ending up in all the wrong places. And then if it turns out not to be venous, get them to the right place. And I, I think all of us in our practice, we've got an arsenal of dermatologists to send them to, you know, if it's pyoderma gangrenosum. If it is um, arterial, we know how to handle that too. So I hope I didn't over talk like I usually do, but does that answer your question? No, I think that's very helpful. Again, you know, (laughs) it's one of the statistics that I found very helpful uh, early on was that most leg ulcers are venous ulcers and to the tune of 70 to 80 percent. So, right. you know, going through vascular training, you feel everything is arterial, but it's really not. It's really venous. So I yeah. completely agree with you that the first, the gatekeeper, so so to say, if that becomes a venous specialist or a venous vascular specialist, that's the way to go and then triage them to wherever else they need to go. So we have a question here from uh, Dr. John Landy. And okay. the question is, the man with the lateral ulcer that you showed in your presentation Was there a component of, I'm guessing what he's asking is axial insufficiency or was it just perforator incompetence? So actually he he had previous treatment and he had a blowout perforator. It was axial first, we treated the axial vein first and then he had a lateral perforator that blew out. So in the end, he ended up having supraingonal disease, which he's in the process actually right now of having that looked at. But the answer is yes, he had axial disease. Yes, we did treat that. This perforator recurred and it was a lateral perforator. Thank you. And now there's a question from Dr. Weiss. The question is, is there any indication for a preventative ablation procedure for a patient post SVT, mild edema, varicosities, uses compression hose in order to reduce edema and prevent ulceration. So, so prevention uh, of, an, of an ulcer. Yes, yes. Now, when you first said, is there a rule for preventative ablation, I thought you were about to say just ablating veins <laughs> for the sake of not having a problem. So there's never an indication to do that. Now, in yes, absolutely. If a patient's had an SVT and they have superficial venous incompetence, I wouldn't call that preventative. I would call that treatment. You're treating the cause of that superficial uh, venous thrombosis. And there's a whole other lecture on that. So don't get me started talking on that and why you would get an SVT. But the question is, the answer is yes. Do the ablation of the incompetent vein that caused the SVT to prevent getting a venous ulcer down the road? Yes. Fantastic. Last question, just wanting to stay on time. Mm-hmm. When in your triage methodology do you start looking for a potential deep venous problem? So in other words, patient comes to you with an ulcer, do you look for it right away? Do you first exhaust all the other ways of treatment with conservative measures, ablation of superficial veins, mm-hmm. and then go there? What is mm-hmm. your recommendation? So the recommendation is to treat the superficial first, and that is because you might be surprised. And deep system investigation, which I you know, love and can talk about that too, as far as looking super inguinal, it is more invasive. So, and I can sometimes be surprised. I can have a C6 or a C4 patient with an incompetent perforator, and I'm thinking in my head, he's going to have deep system problem, but I treat his superficial and it, it works. And he ends up going long-term without any further problem. So you do want to start with the superficial system before you end up looking at the deep system and that perforator. And you, I don't usually ever treat this, the perforator. And this, there's no cookbook, as you all know, for medicine. So I, I'm not, my recommendation's not the recommendation of every vein doctor out there. Some some doctors might look higher up and some doctors may treat that perforator at the same time. But 
in looking at the publications and the recommendations of ADF and um, Society of Vascular Surgery, usually recommend treating the superficial system first, re-examining later, if the perforator is still there and it's still incompetent, looking higher up into the deep system. Yeah. You know, one, one common rule I've always found very helpful when there is when I'm, there are no clear guidelines, what would I do if this patient was my, mother. Know, my family member? Right. I mean, why would I stent someone or do other things when a simple ablation exactly. would take care of things? Again, we'll take one last question. I'm sorry, this is from Dr. Ojual Datta. Uh, if a patient presents with a small VLU, uh, how many weeks of conservative treatment is recommended before referral to you? I know you addressed that earlier. Yep. But no. since uh, Dr. Yeah. Datta specifically asked that, I thought yeah. we should. Yeah. Absolutely, and I would love to address that again because that is such a hard thing to overturn, and that's with that Eshgar trial recommendation that you want to try um, six months of four to six months of uh, wound care and compression before you do the intervention. So the hard and fast answer is I want to look at that, and if there's uh, in, treat the insufficiency as soon as possible. Now, unfortunately, sometimes your insurance company will dictate how soon that can be and how the patient has to undergo a compression stocking trial. It, it disappoints me because there's no real science behind that, uh, making them wear six months of compression or three months or six weeks before you do the intervention. But I always go on the latest research, the latest publication, which is the EVRA trial, indicating that early intervention, meaning when you see that ulcer, you do your exam. If there is insufficiency, treat the insufficiency and use the compression at the same time, faster healing, less recurrence. Well, Zoe, thank you very much again for an absolutely amazing talk. Uh, folks out there, those of you who Trust us with your patients, with all 90 of our centers. We're always so grateful to you for your referrals. For the other uh, pain physicians, uh, venous and lymphatic disorder physicians, I hope you find these uh, series helpful. Please do participate as much as possible. We are all trying to learn, and CVR is also just trying to make these talks better and better. This was just our second talk. We are bringing our superstars up first because we know with somebody like Dr. Deol, Dr. Morrison, Dr. Satwa, who's going to be on next time, the chances of us screwing up are very, very small. <laughs> so, uh, you know, thank you for your patience, but this will continue to get better and better. And, uh, you know, next time it's going to be Dr. Satwa. We are hoping to have a very strong panel associated with that. And let's try to make this as interactive as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Jessica, you have some comments uh, to make sure everything happens right? Yes, thank you, Dr. Lachenpaul. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. And as mentioned, our next webinar is on June 26th. Please check the chat for the registration link. Um, and also, you know, you can also write this down if you'd like to register online at any point after today. Um, you will also expect to receive your CME certificate within 30 to 60 days by email. So please keep an eye out for that. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Again, thank you. And we look forward to you all joining us on the 26th and have a great Friday. Thank you. Bye, everyone.